coming in at our number 10 spot, Funai Agent. Located in the Amazonian jungle, the Karuru tribe is estimated to have a population of roughly 150 people and are definitely not a tribe to visit. While there have been previous successful attempts at making contact with the Karibu people, on August 2nd, 1997, a member of Brazil's Funai Agency, which is a government group dedicated to the protection of isolated communities, attempted to make contact with the group, trying to establish peaceful relations with the community. But this man would not make it out alive. In fact, in over a decade, the Funai lost seven of its men in an attempt to make contact with the Karibu people and finally decided they would no longer try. The government still provides them with modern immunizations and established their community as a national park in order to halt logging. Not much else is known of the isolated group as the government will not let any anthropologists visit in fear they may not return. Next up at number nine, Benedict Allen. While on his second trip to visit the Yefo people, a remote Papua New Guinea tribe with little to no contact with the outside world, after being dropped off by a helicopter to the remote land, he trekked for three weeks into the forest, hoping to track down the people who he had met years prior in 1988. He did actually eventually find the community once again, but not long after suddenly seemed to have disappeared. And the media outlets had no clue where Alan was or even if he was still alive. Famously, he said to not come looking for him if he was thought to be missing, though this request was not followed by the media. Now, I will level with you, he was actually eventually found. But he wasn't happy with the outcome as he insisted he was not lost and did not want to be saved. But ill with malaria, he accepted the help and was flown out to a hospital. Coming in at number eight, 1950s Mennonites. Located in Bolivia and the Paraguay, the Oreo people are a very isolated group. About 5,000 members remain in the community, and while their current threat is deforestation, you also don't want to take your chances visiting this community. Their first known contact with outsiders was way back in the 40s and 50s when a large group of Mennonite farmers forcibly took their land to raise pigs. Well, as you can imagine, this did not go over well and many were killed by the Oreo people. Later again, in 1986, a group of missionaries attempting to evangelize the community was not well appreciated and five men did not make it out alive. Long story short, just leave them alone and they'll leave you alone. Next up at number seven, Don Phillips and Bruno Pereira. In an attempt to write a novel on how to help save the Amazonian rainforest, journalist Don Phillips and an indigenous rights activist, Bruno Pereira, headed into the lawless jungle and never returned. After being reported missing for a few weeks, remains of the two men were actually found, but who or what killed them in the depths of the jungle is unknown. Some believe it could have been a tribe defending their land, while others have theorized it could have been other intruders, as the two men were writing a novel revealing the dark underbelly of the area. Whatever it was, I think it's safe to say it's best to keep out of the isolated communities or you run the risk of never being seen again. Next up at number six, Nicholas Flores. Largely gathered in Peru, the Masha Piro tribe is estimated to have between 100 and 250 members, and they are considered extremely dangerous to any outsider. In 2012, in fact, archaeologist Diego Cortillo visited the isolated community in an attempt to learn and get pictures of the Masha Piro people, which he did, and they were released later in a survival international. However, it was his local guide, Nicholas Flores, who was found dead six days later with bamboo-tipped arrow struck through his heart. Most likely meant as a sign to ward off further intruders as the clan likely fears being killed by disease or having their communities taken over by outsiders as has been attempted in the past. Either way, best to just steer clear. Next up at number five, Riel Francisco. 
Now, not too long ago, in June of 2020, a longtime member of Funai and an expert of the Amazonian attempted to make contact with the Uru i Wau Wau territory in Rondonia. His life mission was to protect these people, and though he was known to make successful and peaceful attempts with other communities in the past, this time he would not be so lucky. Likely thought to be an attacker by the local tribe, as is often the case in their experience with many poachers and illegal loggers known to frequent the area. Francescato was shot through the heart with a bow and arrow and left for dead. A witness claims that Riel cried out and actually pulled the arrow from his chest and began to run away, but not long after collapsed. It seems like no matter what your motives might be, that these people do not want you there. So let's just all agree to stop trying. Next up at number four, Alejandro Lavaca and Inez Arango. Located in Ecuador, the Tagheri people live a hunting and foraging lifestyle and have long resisted outsiders in their community. Most notably, back in 1987, when a bishop, Alejandro Lavaca, and his sister, Inez Arango, decided to travel to the area in hopes to preach Christianity to the locals. They were dropped off by helicopter and planned to be picked up a few days later, but as I'm sure you've guessed, this would not be the case. A few days went by and the helicopter pilot came back to retrieve the bishop and his sister only to find them brutally killed, their corpses laid out as a warning sign to intruders. Do not come back. This would not stop people, however, as recently as 2008, a man was found in the area with nine iron-headed spears jutting out of his stomach. Coming in at number three, John Allen Cho. Likely the most well-known of the isolated clans, the Sentinelese people live on a wooden island in the Indian Ocean and are fierce protectors of their home. The community made headlines when, in 2018, even though it was, and still is, illegal to visit this tribe, an American missionary named John Allen Cho ignored all laws and decided he would still visit the indigenous people to spread the word of God. He managed to bribe several fishermen in order to reach the island, and as was completely expected, the Sentinelli assassinated him not too long after his arrival, likely with bows and arrows. All the fishermen that helped Cho in his mission were arrested and the island remains illegal to all visitors. Next up at number two, we have Helena Valero. Okay, so this one is kind of cheating because she did in fact return. But this story is so crazy, I had to include it on the list. Back in the 1930s, a young girl named Helena Valero was kidnapped at just 13 years old when her family was attacked by a nearby tribe. Helena lived near the Amazon forest with her farmer parents, but once captured was taken to live with a tribe known as Shemateri. Helena accidentally gave poisonous toad eggs to one of the other children, and that child's father found out and threatened to kill her, so she ran away deeper into the forest where she lived for seven months. Eventually, she ended up reaching a new tribe called the Namote, but was not welcome at first, so once again, she fled back into the woods believing they were going to kill her. But things took a turn when later she was caught by the head man of the tribe and ended up actually falling in love with and marrying him, becoming his third wife. Years went by and Helena had two children with the chief, but Sadly, he was killed by an opposing tribe. This threatened Helena and the life of her children. Scared for her and her children's life, she fled with them to another nearby tribe, uninvolved with the feud, and eventually married again. Unlike her previous marriage, however, her second husband was not kind to her, but still she gave him two more children. Her life takes a turn when the tribe that killed her first husband relocated near her once again, and Helena, fearing for her life and terribly unhappy in her marriage, escaped to live among white men again. But 
rather shockingly, upon her return to her previous home, she was rejected by her family and living in poverty and not well taken care of at all. Helena eventually decided life was better among the Yanomami people and returned to live out the remainder of her life there. Coming in in our number one spot is Michael Rockefeller. Located in South Papa, Indonesia, the Otsjenup village belongs to the Asmat people and unlike some of the others on this list, they're not actually widely known as being specifically violent or dangerous. In fact, in modern times, while still very isolated, they've been known to seek out higher education and incorporate modern technologies into the village. But in November of 1961, one man would not be so lucky. Michael Rockefeller, the son of famous and incredibly wealthy New York governor, disappeared on an expedition to visit the Asmat people. He was apparently on the trip as he was looking to curate a collection of the local art from the isolated group to bring back to his family's museum in New York. But he would never make it back. Rockefeller was last seen swimming to the shore when his boat overturned, and for years, no one really knew what happened to him. But recently, author Carl Hoffman decided to dive into the tale and see what he could find. He revisited the exact location where Michael traveled all those years ago, and according to the locals he spoke with, they said, quote, on shore he saw familiar faces, those of the Otschenep warriors. Instead of the rescue Rockefeller hoped for, he was stabbed in the ribs by one of the men, fatally killed in the precise actions of ritualistic headhunting and consumed by the warriors. Coming in at number 10, we have Bruce Parry. Bruce Parry is a British presenter and documentary maker, as well as a former marine, an explorer, an indigenous rights advocate and author. Parry fronted a BBC series called Tribe in which he met a load of remote tribes in Africa, Papua New Guinea, the Amazon and Polynesia. Generally, Parry's policy was to leave the isolated tribes alone for fear of introducing illness to them. In the series he finds lost tribes and convorts with cannibals. Here's a clip of Bruce and the crew, um, fitting in with the locals. It could, you know, it could finally open the last barrier between us and them from their point of view. And Bruce is hung like a brontosaurus so um, they couldn't find one to fit him. What is that about? I do not understand that apparatus. In their follow up series, Amazon, the team did actually make first contact with the tribe and they caught it on camera. He stumbled into what I now believe was a first contact. Hello, Peggy. It seems that the tribe thought that the arrival of white ghosts in their territory was a sign the sky would fall. Because of their skin colour, they thought that they were the white ghosts. Coming in at number 9, we have the New Tribes Mission. The New Tribes Mission were a fundamentalist group of missionaries now known as Ethanos 360. It is likely they changed their name due to the bad press their previous one had attracted. In the 1980s, the New Tribes Mission decided that they wanted to convert Amazonian tribes to Christianity as they took it upon themselves to decide that they were living in the dark. They made first contact with the Zoe tribe of Brazil. First they dropped gifts over the village and by 1987 they made first real contact. Sadly, like with a lot of first contact experiences, they brought disease with them and 45 members of the tribe died from flu or malaria transmitted to them from the protestants. The ill health spread further and the missionaries hadn't the supplies to help them. In the end, the government expelled the missionaries in 1991 and since then the health of the Zoe have been improved. Coming into number 8 we have the Russian doctors. It seems that Russian physicians were the first to establish contact with the Surma tribe of Ethiopia in the 1980s. The Surma women have since been photographed and are known to wear huge lip plates made out of clay, with the size increased each year. The bigger the plate, the more beautiful the woman is in their culture. It seems that the Russians gave the Surma people Kalashnikov rifles. While they have shunned other areas of outside culture and civilization, apparently they did like the guns for protecting their cattle against predators. Coming into number 7, we have the Brazilian government employee. In 2011, a Brazilian government employee working at Funai stumbled across the Kawahiva tribe. The Funai is the government agency that looks after and protects indigenous tribes, and this particular tribe hadn't been spotted for generations. In the video, we see 
naked tribespeople, men carrying spears, and a woman carrying a child. It is thought that this is the first time the tribe had contact with a civilian in decades. Now, sadly, the tribe is under threat from loggers and farmers right now. Coming into number six, we have the aircraft flyover. In 2008, one of the last remaining uncontacted tribes was caught on camera in an aircraft flying in the region of the Brazilian Peruvian border. It is thought that there are between 100 to a couple of thousand small uncontacted tribes living in the Amazon. It's not known which tribe was caught on camera here, as it is thought that this was the first sighting of the tribe in a very, very long time. In the pictures taken, we see tribes people have painted their bodies red, yellow, and black. They're looking up at their helicopter, being like, what's happening? Coming in at number five, we have Scott Wallace and the Peruvian Ministry. In 2011, Scott Wallace shared footage permitted for release by the Ministry of the Environment of an uncontacted tribe in Peru. Scott is a photographer with a special interest in small tribes. He released a book called The Unconquered about his experience tracking tribes in the deep Amazon. The footage that he shot shows the moment the islanders spot the camera and their reaction. Most of them seem to wield spears in self defense. To be honest, what would you do if I was in a tribe and I saw some strange person coming at me? I'd probably grab my spear too. This seems like a natural human instinct. Next up, something that Scott Wallace talks about extensively on his website, we have the miners who murdered at number four. Illegal mining has become a problem along the Amazon rivers in Brazil as the practice is massively disturbing indigenous tribes as well as weakening the land. It seems miners were overheard in a bar boasting about how they met an uncontacted tribe for the first time and massacred them. The miners were drinking at a frontier town and bragged about killing quote unquote wild Indians. When some of the miners were apprehended, it seems that clay pots and paddles likely made by the tribe were found in their possession. As the tribe they allegedly killed are uncontactable and a 12 hour boat trip away, it is unknown whether or not their drunk boasts about the encounter are true. Coming into number three, we have Michael Rockefeller. You have likely heard of the Rockefeller dynasty. The Rockefeller Center in New York is an enduring reminder of one of America's richest families. Michael Rockefeller Rockefeller was the son of Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller, an oil heir, the 49th governor of New York, and eventually the 41st vice president of the United States. In 1961, 23 year old Michael went on a trip to Azmat, New Guinea, with the intention of finding some of the lost tribes and collecting indigenous art. Rockefeller wrote to his family to say that he found the country wild and remote and exciting. Michael's boat capsized near Otsnajep, and it was widely suspected that he was killed by a small tribe and likely cannibalized. This is a very sad tale up next at number two. We have Bishop Alan Jedro Lavaca and Sister Inez Arango. The two Catholic missionaries, a bishop and a nun, were making first contact with the Warani tribe and the Orcas tribe. They were hoping to convert them all to Christianity. Tale as old as time, isn't it? Here is a picture of the bishop and the sister amid their mission. Before they met with the tribe in 1987, they dropped them gifts to try and gain their friendship. Sadly for the missionaries, it simply didn't work. The Spanish bishop and Colombian nun were brutally murdered by the tribe in a sacrificial way. When the bishop's body was found, it contained 67 spear wounds. The pair had been nailed to the ground and their wounds were filled with leaves to stop the blood. Finally, coming into number one, we have John Allen Chow. The North Centennial Island amid the Indian Ocean has been home to an uncontactable indigenous tribe for 60,000 years, the Centennialese. They do not want any interference from the outside world, and until Recently, the tribe has been spotted only through far off images. Those unfortunate enough to get close to them have been attacked and often killed. The tribe have also been known to fire arrows at low flying planes. It's hard to contact a tribe who literally have no interest in communication. In 2006, two fishermen who were illegally harvesting crabs were killed by the tribe, but in 2018, John Allen Chow, a 26 year old American missionary, was sent by the All Nations group to make contact and live among the tribe, hoping, once again, to convert them to Christianity. He kept a journal of his attempts to spread the word of Jesus. He said he sang songs and offered the Bible to the tribe, which shot at and pierced the Bible with an arrow. He persisted to no avail and was met with a mixture of laughter and hostility. It was last reported by the crew who went with him that he was dragged away and killed. His body was spotted lifeless on the shore. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Toromona. The Toromona are a group of people who are indigenous to Bolivia and they live near the upper Medici River. 
River, which is a part of the Amazon basin, and the Heath River in the northwestern area of Bolivia. There hasn't been any notable contact with this tribe aside from other indigenous tribes, but this tribe was talked about a lot when a Norwegian biologist searched specifically for this tribe for many years before he mysteriously disappeared in the region of the Madidi Park in 1997. This tribe has remained quite isolated, and the most recent known sighting in the 21st century was when the Arona people of Bolivia informed an anthropologist named Michael Brohan that they had contacted a group that was in voluntary isolation on the eastern bank of the Marini River. It wasn't confirmed that this was the Toromona tribe, but it is believed that that's who they saw. Thankfully, in 2006, Bolivia's administrative resolution created an exclusive, reserved, and untouchable portion of the Medidi National Park in order to protect the Toromona and their desires to be uncontacted. In our number nine spot today, we have the Kawahiva. The Kawahiva peoples used to be referred to as the Rio Pardo Indians, and they are an uncontacted tribe that resides in Mato Grosso, Brazil. This group is definitely nomadic people, and so most of what we know about them comes from the things they leave behind when moving to a new place, such as arrows, baskets, hammocks, and their communal houses. It is unclear exactly when the Kawahiva people became a tribe, as our knowledge of their modern existence began in 1999, but it is believed that this group goes as far back as the 1700s. As I mentioned before, they live in communal houses and they use a primitive form of a spinning wheel in order to make string, and they use tree bark to make nets. It is very rare for a non-indigenous group to have a sighting of the Kawahiva, and neighboring tribes refer to them as either tiny people or redheads. It is believed that loggers in the area have intentionally tried to keep the Kawahiva on the run, and it is speculated by the human rights group Survival International that the women of the tribe have stopped giving birth. It is unclear exactly how many Kawahiva people there are left, but it is estimated to be around four separate Kawahiva bands, with maybe around 15 people in each band. Like many of the tribes on today's list, their existence is always threatened by deforestation, illegal logging, and just attempts to either kill or enslave them. In 2001, the tribe's land was put under local protection, but that protection was periodically removed by the courts before being later reinstated. And in 2012, the land was turned into an official official reservation. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Carabao. The Carabao are a group of uncontacted people who live in the Rio Pure National Park in the southeastern corner of Colombia. The Carabao live in at least three longhouses, which are usually narrow, single room houses. They share this national park with both the Pase and the Jumana peoples. In the last 400 years, there has been outsider contact with the Carabao people, but not much as the contact usually involves violent attacks by slave traders and rubber extractors, which has only increased their their desire for isolation, which makes a lot of sense. It is believed that these people may refer to themselves as the Yakumo, and there truly isn't much that is known about them, which honestly is probably a good thing. In December of 2001, the president, Juan Manuel Santos, signed legal decree number 4633, which was designed to guarantee uncontacted peoples rights to their voluntary isolation, their traditional territories, and even reparations if they face violence from outsiders, which which really is such a great thing. While this decree alone, of course, isn't going to stop some people from illegal contact, it is nice to see that steps are being made to protect these people. In our number seven spot today, we have the Namole or the Namol. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this one. The Namole people are an indigenous tribe of nomadic hunter gatherers who inhabit the remote regions of a national park in Peru, which is part of the Amazon rainforest. They are more commonly referred to as the Mashko Piro peoples, but that name was first used in 1687 to refer to those who are native to Peru, but it's actually considered a derogatory term considering the word mashko means savages. In 1998, there was estimated to be around 100 to 250 members of this tribe, which was a welcomed increase from the 1976 estimate of somewhere from 20 to 100. The Nomale peoples have actively avoided any contact with non-indigenous people, and truly, who could blame them? In 1894, most of this tribe was slaughtered by the private army of Carlos Fitzgerald, who was a rubber baron. Those who survived this attack retreated to the most remote forest areas where they could be safe. In the 21st century, there's been an increase in the sightings of people from this tribe, but they certainly still are not actively 
seeking any contact with the outside world. In our number 6 spot today we have the Dalala. The Dalala are an indigenous people of Brazil living in the lower Valle do Javari in the western Amazon basin. These peoples are split into two groups, one splinter group led by a woman named Maya that is around 23 people, while the larger main group is around 150 people. This split between the groups came from a dispute between around 20 members and while the larger group remains quite isolated, the smaller group has had some infrequent contact with neighboring settlements. The hunting and war weapon of choice of this tribe is the club, but they are also known to use poison darts. Both the men and women of this tribe paint themselves with red dye that is made from plants. There is little that is known about the religious or spiritual practices, but it is known that they live in communal huts, which is something that is different from many of the uncontacted tribes on today's list. This tribe is more often referred to as the Korubo people, but apparently this name was given to them by a former enemy tribe and is said to be negative and degrading, which is why we will be referring to them by the less common name of Dalala. This tribe's biggest struggle in terms of illness and death at the moment seems to be malaria. This tribe has a long history with the massacres of indigenous peoples, so it makes sense that they want to remain isolated and have not welcomed outside contact very much since the 1950s. In 1996, there began expeditions to try and make peaceful contact, but the Dalala are known to kill trespassers on their land, which we truly cannot blame them for, and the most recent incident of this nature came in 2000 when three lumbermen were killed near the native reservation. It definitely serves as a reminder to leave people who don't want to be contacted alone. If they want our influence, they know where to find us. In our number 5 spot today we have the Aorio. The Aori people are the indigenous people of Gran Chaco and they live in both Bolivia as well as Paraguay. There are approximately 5600 Aorio peoples and while many of them ended up becoming sedentarized by missionaries in the 20th century, there are around 100 people who have still maintained the traditional nomadic hunter gatherer lifestyle and remain uncontacted. The Aorio were first contacted by Jesuits in the 1720s to try and convert people to Catholicism and in the 1740s the mission was abandoned and the Aorio were luckily left alone. Until the 1900s. The Chaco War between Bolivia and Paraguay brought in 100,000 troops to the territory as well as all of the diseases they carried. Both countries saw the Aorio as a problem and from the 1940s to the 1970s there was a rule where a Paraguayan soldier could be freed from service by killing one of them. At this time Aorio children were also being stolen and one 12 year old was even put on display in an exhibit. In the 1940s and 50s the work of missionaries continued and in the late 50s missionaries used force and manipulation to remove the Aorio from their land to various mission stations and the land where they once lived was sold for cattle farming. These mission stations forced the Aorio living in them to give up their culture including their religion, appearance, music and diet and missionaries sometimes convinced the Aorio living at the missions to find uncontacted Aorio in the forest to sedentarize and convert them. And in December of 1986 that unsurprisingly turned out to be a horrible idea that led to 5 deaths. The Aorio people who are in contact now are struggling with both poverty as well as discrimination and the uncontacted Aorio have 6 main threats which are cattle farming and deforestation, sale and allocation of their territory, searches for oil, missionary seeking contact, illegal collection of territory resources, and violation of territory by various groups. I could dive into each of these points and discuss why they are such a threat to these people, but I'll leave that for your homework because we have got to keep this list moving right along. In our number 4 spot today we have the Tagari. The Tagari are an eastern Huayorani people living in the Ecuadorian Amazon basin. This group was once a part of the Huayori families, but they separated off in 1968 after refusing missionary settlement and since then have lived in isolation. Their name comes from one of their members, Tag. There haven't been many interactions since then with other Huayorani, but the interactions that have happened are often met with violence. It is estimated that there are around 20 to 30 surviving Tagari, and they are one of the two remaining indigenous groups living in voluntary isolation in Ecuador. These people are semi nomadic and live off hunting and gathering as well as a few crops. Since 2007 there has been a national policy to try and help protect them that includes untouchability, self determination, equality and no contact. The threats to the Tagari include illegal loggers of tropical hardwood, foreign disease, smugglers, settlers and oil companies moving into the area with drilling taking place all over their land. In 2008 investigators 
investigations began into reports that five Tagari people had been killed by illegal loggers. As we get closer to the end of our list, it becomes abundantly clear that many of these isolated tribes face extremely similar threats, which is quite interesting and unfortunately extremely unsurprising. In our number three spot today, we have the Teromanane. Remember in the last point about the Tagari, how I mentioned that they were one of the last two uncontacted tribes in Ecuador? Well, this is the other one. These people live in the Yasuni National Park in the Ecuadorian Amazon basin, and this tribe also has some distant relations to the Hue Orani people. There's estimated to be around 150 to 300 people in this tribe who maintain their nomadic lifestyle in the rainforest. While, like everyone else on their list, two of their main threats are oil developments and illegal loggers, the Teromanane have another, more unexpected threat, and that is the Hue Orani. In 2013, more than 20 of these people were killed by the Hue Arani, which left two child survivors who were taken as hostages. Apparently, the people who took part in this terrible tragedy bragged about it on national television at first, calling themselves brave for attacking and taking the lives of unarmed people with rifles, pistols, and long spears, and even went as far as selling photos of it to the highest bidder. There's so much to cover in regards to this one incident that I unfortunately don't have time for, but the whole situation is extremely tragic and just downright horrible. Much of these disputes stem from the land that they share because of the fact that the Taromanane have been pushed deeper into the forest from the Huayarani allowing oil companies to drill on the land. It of course is a very complicated issue that has so much more to it. In our number two spot today we have the Awa, our group of people living in the eastern Amazon rainforest. There are around 350 living members but not all of them remain uncontacted. Out of the 350 it is believed that around 100 members continue to try to remain uncontacted, although it unfortunately has hasn't been as easy as it should for them. The Awa were once settled people but began to live a more nomadic lifestyle around the 1800s in order to try and escape incursions by Europeans. They were further threatened by settlers who cleared out most of the forests on their land. In 1982, the Brazilian government received a loan of 900 million US dollars from the World Bank and the European Union, but under a condition that the lands of certain indigenous peoples, including the Awa, be protected. This should have been the key to helping protect these peoples considering their lives lives were continually being threatened. There were many cases of tribespeople being killed by settlers, and the forest on which they depended was being destroyed by logging and land clearance for farming. Unfortunately, it took the government over 20 years to actually act on this condition, and finally in March of 2003, the Awa's land was finally distinguished. And to make matters a little worse for these peoples, there are always people who won't respect their land, no matter what laws are in place. In late 2011, illegal loggers burned an 8-year-old Awa girl alive after she wandered out of her village, and a leader from another group of people said that the girl had been killed as a warning to other native peoples living in the protected area. According to the human rights organization that campaigns for the rights of indigenous tribal peoples, Survival International, the Awa are the Earth's most threatened tribe. The Awa forests are still disappearing faster than any other area in the Brazilian Amazon, and loggers still remain as their biggest threat. No industry or amount of money is worth these people's lives and their way of life and serious action to protect them needs to be taken before it's too late. In our number one spot today we have the man of the hole. This one is quite different from the others on this list because not only is this only one man, but we don't actually know the name of the tribe that he belongs to. It is believed that he may be the last known survivor of his people who were probably all killed by cattle ranchers, which is absolutely devastating. Because of the fact that we do not know his name, what tribe he belongs to, or even what language he speaks, his nickname, the man of the hole comes from the large holes he digs, which are created to trap animals, as well as a place for him to hide, but it is also believed that these holes may have had a spiritual significance to the tribe that he belongs to. His isolated existence first became known in 1996, and it is believed that the other members of his tribe were killed in a number of clashes between the 1980s and the 1990s. One expert explains that, quote, he should not be seen as a recluse hiding from society. The man is the survivor of genocide. He didn't choose to live alone. He lives in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, and in 2007, the Brazilian government declared that the 31 square mile area around him would be off limits to trespassing and development, and an additional 11.5 square miles was later added to that. He is often monitored from afar in order to prevent any unwelcome guests from entering his land, but despite these attempts, he was still attacked by gunmen in 2009 and thankfully managed to survive like the warrior that he absolutely is. He maintains avoiding contact with others 
others, although he does know that he is being monitored. The Brazilian government's protection agency, FUNAI, will periodically leave him gifts of tools and seeds, and he will sometimes signal to observing teams so as to warn them of the holes he dug, so it seems as though there's some sort of trust that has been built there, which really is a nice thing to hear. In 2018, the FUNAI released a video of him with the intention of raising global awareness of the threats that face the uncontacted peoples in Brazil, and he appeared as though he may be somewhere in his 50s, but seemed in very good health. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Aorio. The Aorio people are the indigenous people of the Gran Chaco, and they live in both Bolivia as well as Paraguay. There are approximately 5,600 Aorio peoples, and while many of them ended up becoming sedentarized by missionaries in the 20th century, there are around 100 people who have still maintained the traditional nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle and remain uncontacted. The Aorio were first contacted by Jesuits in the 1720s to try and convert people to Catholicism, and in the 1740s, the mission was abandoned and the Aorio people were luckily left alone. Until the 1900s. The Chaco War between Bolivia and Paraguay brought in 100,000 troops to the territory, as well as all of the diseases that they carried. Both countries saw the Aorio as a problem, and from the 1940s to the 1970s, there was a rule where a Paraguayan soldier could be freed from service by killing an Aorio. At this time, young Aorio people were also being stolen, and one was even put on display in an exhibit. In the 1940s and 50s, the work of missionaries continued, and in the late 50s, missionaries used force and manipulation to remove the Aorio from their land to various mission stations, and the land where they once lived was sold for cattle farming. These mission stations forced the Aorio people living in them to give up their culture, including their religion, appearance, music, and diet, and missionaries sometimes convinced the Aorio living at the missions to find other uncontacted Aorio in the forest to sedentarize and convert, and in December of 1986, that unsurprisingly turned out to be a horrible idea that led to five deaths. The Aorio people who are in contact now are struggling with both poverty as well as discrimination, and the uncontacted Aorio have six main threats, which are cattle farming and deforestation, sale and allocation of their territory, searches for oil, missionaries seeking contact, illegal collection of territory resources, and violation of territory by various groups. I could dive into each one of these points and discuss why they are such a threat to these people, but I'll leave that for your homework because we've got to keep this list moving right along. In our number nine spot today, we have the Tagari. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit that thumbs up button. The Tagari are an Eastern Huayarani people living in the Ecuadorian Amazon basin. The group was once a part of the Huayarani families, but they separated off in 1968 after refusing missionary settlement and since then have lived in isolation. Their name comes from one of their members, Tag. There haven't been many interactions since then with other Huayarani, but the interactions that have happened are often met with violence. It is estimated that there are around 20 to 30 surviving Tagari, and they are one of the two remaining indigenous groups living in voluntary isolation in Ecuador. These people are semi-nomadic and live off hunting and gathering, as well as a few crops. Since 2007, there has been a national policy to try and help protect them that includes untouchability, self-determination, equality, and no contact. In our number eight spot today, we have the Yanomami. The Yanomami people have been living in the rainforest stretching from southern Venezuela to northern Brazil for thousands and thousands of years. They are much larger than many of the other tribes that we've talked about, with around 35,000 people. There are Yanomami people who are in minimal contact, although they still maintain their traditions and way of life. They live in communal houses that can hold up to 400 people, and they strongly believe in equality with no chiefs or leaders, but instead teachers and shamans. Because of the contact they have had, however, there have been outbreaks of diseases such as malaria, tuberculosis, and influenza. These are fatal to their communities as they of course have no immunity built up. Some of these outbreaks first occurred in the 1970s and the tribe is still struggling to contain them. In seven years, more than 20% of the tribe passed away from this combined with the conflict over the land that they live on. In our number seven spot today, we have the Awa. The Awa are a group of people living in the eastern Amazon rainforest. There are around 350 living members, but not all of them remain uncontacted. Out of the 350, it is believed that around 100 members continue to try and remain uncontacted, although it unfortunately hasn't been as easy as it should be for them. The Awa were once settled people, but they began to live a more nomadic lifestyle around the 1800s in order to try and escape incursions by the Europeans. They were further threatened by settlers who cleared out most of the forests on their land. In 1982, the Brazilian government received a loan of 900 million US dollars from the World Bank and the European
European Union, but under a condition that the lands of certain indigenous peoples, including the Awa, would be protected. This should have been the key to helping protect these peoples, considering their lives were continually being threatened. There were many cases of tribes, people being killed by settlers, and the forest on which they depended was being destroyed by logging and land clearance for farming. Unfortunately, it took the government over 20 years to actually act on this condition, and finally, in March of 2003, the Awa's land was finally distinguished. And to make matters a little worse for these people, there are always people who won't respect their land, no matter what laws are in place. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Taro Menane. Remember a couple of points ago how the Tagari, how I mentioned that they were one of the last two uncontacted tribes in Ecuador? Well, this is the last one. These people live on the Yusuni National Park in the Ecuadorian Amazon Basin, and this tribe also has some distinct relations to the Huayarani people. There is estimated to be around 150 to 30 people in this tribe who maintain their nomadic lifestyle in the rainforest. While, like everyone else on this list, two of their main threats are oil development and illegal loggers, these guys have another, more unexpected threat, and that is the Huayarani. In 2013, more than 20 of this tribe were killed by other Huayarani which left two child survivors who were taken as hostages. Apparently, the people who took part in this terrible tragedy bragged about it on national television at first, calling themselves braves for attacking and taking the lives of unarmed people with rifles, pistols, and long spears, and even went as far as selling photos of it to the highest bidder. There is so much to cover in regards to this one incident that I unfortunately just like don't have time for, but the whole situation is extremely tragic and just downright horrible. Much of the these disputes stem from the land that they share because of the fact that this tribe has been pushed deeper into the forest from the Huayarani, allowing oil companies to drill on the land. It is, of course, a very complicated issue that has so much more to it. In our number five spot today, we have the Toromona. The Toromona are a group of people who are indigenous to Bolivia, and they live near the upper Medidi River, which is a part of the Amazon Basin, and the Heath River in the northwestern area of Bolivia. There hasn't been any notable contact with this tribe aside from other indigenous indigenous tribes, but this tribe was talked about a lot when a Norwegian biologist searched specifically for the tribe for many years before he mysteriously disappeared in the region of the Medidi Park in 1997. This tribe has remained quite isolated, and the most recent known sighting in the 21st century was when the Aerona people of Bolivia informed an anthropologist named Michael Brohan that they had contacted a group that was in voluntary isolation on the eastern bank of the Manarini River. It wasn't confirmed that this was the Toromo a tribe, but it is believed that that's who they saw. Thankfully, in 2006, Bolivia's administrative resolution created an exclusive, reserved, and untouchable portion of the Medidi National Park in order to protect the Toromona and their desires to be uncontacted. In our number four spot today, we have the Carafeana. The Carafeana are an extremely small group of only about 50 people who remain extremely uncontacted. Because of this, there is very little information available about them. They are located within the Amazon regions of Brazil, so like many of the other tribes that live in the area, they are threatened by illegal logging, oil companies, and destruction of their land. It is believed that they practice a religion that is based on other living creatures and things around them, such as plants and animals, but the specifics of this remain very much a mystery. They are a nomadic group of hunter-gatherers, and it is unclear if they partake in any kinds of agriculture or horticulture. While it would be, of course, super interesting and great to know more about this tribe and the people, it is kind of refreshing to hear about a tribe we know so little about because they mostly have just been left alone. Of course, that doesn't mean the outside world has been great to them, but just maybe less worse. In our number three spot today, we have the Sapanawa. The Sapanawa are a group living in the uncontacted frontier, which is the area of land that straddles the borders of Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil, and is the home to more uncontacted tribes than anywhere else on earth. A group of Sapawana people recently made contact in 2014 because of the fact that their homes were attacked and burnt to the ground by outsiders. So many of their people passed away in this brutal attack that they were unable to bury them all. This all stems from the lack of punishment that has been given to illegal loggers and drug smugglers in the reason, as well as all the missionaries in the area who are careless when it comes to spreading the diseases that we may have built up an immunity to, but the same cannot be said for these uncontacted tribes. In our number two spot today, we have the Moxitetu. These people are one of the last remaining uncontacted tribes that are a part of the Yanomami people. They have all the similar traditions and values, and the Yanomami people who are in contact have reported seeing them before. They also explained that they 
mayor living in the area of the forest with the highest concentration of illegal miners, which poses many threats to their way of life. Not only are these miners bringing the potentially fatal diseases that we've discussed, but there of course will also be major and deadly conflict if the tribe comes in contact with the miners. The mining not only harms the land they live on, but the miners use high-powered hoses and mercury to extract the gold, which then pollutes the rivers and the forest. Most of the mining is illegal in the first place, and near gold mining sites, the plants and animals surrounding them have been found to have extremely high levels of mercury contamination. With these plants and animals being the only source of food for this tribe, this mining is also increasing their chance of severe health problems due to the contamination. In our number one spot today, we have the Sentinelese. The Sentinelese are the tribe who inhabit North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal in the northeastern Indian Ocean. They have actively resisted any contact from the outside world and are known to kill anyone who tries to trespass on their land. In 1956, the government of India declared the island a tribal reserve and prohibited any travel within three nautical miles of the island, which truthfully is for the best. It is unclear how many people are in the tribe, but it is estimated to be between 15 to 500 people, with somewhere around 50 to 200 being the most likely. The Sentinelese are hunter-gatherers and they use bow and arrows to hunt wildlife and as well to catch local seafood. As of right now, it isn't believed that they take part in agriculture, but it is tough to say as we of course cannot really get a look inside their ways of life. The first peaceful contact was made with the Sentinelese in 1991, but visits to the island stopped in 1997 and that is probably the right thing. While it would be amazing to know more about this tribe and their ways of life, the feeling clearly isn't mutual, so the right thing would be to just let them live their lives the way they want. Starting off this countdown, we have the cannibalism. A lot of people are under the impression that the Sentinelese people on this island are cannibals. Because of their hostility and unadvanced lifestyle, people think they are completely wild. On a number of occasions, trespassers have been killed by this tribe, their bodies put on display before being buried never eaten. It's also believed that this theory was born after learning about the practices of a neighboring tribe. That tribe would cut up and burn the flesh of the deceased tribe members. This was said to prevent them from being consumed by evil spirits. But in 2006, a group of researchers studied the island and found no evidence that they practiced this deed. So it seems like this creepy theory is inaccurate. Moving on to number nine, we have the secret facility. Okay, this next theory is more on the wild side. It was posted by Reddit user SlyFry. According to them, they have a theory that North Sentinel Island is home to a top secret research facility, and the people on the island are protecting it. I mean, the Sentinelese are very violent, and they will kill anyone that comes close to their island. Maybe it's because they have to guard this secret facility with their life. I mean, it would be a good place for a secret facility, just because of how secret and protected the island is. And it would be the last place people would think a secret facility would be. That's just one crazy theory. It also could explain why the Indian government doesn't allow sharing of images taken of the Sentinelese or of the island. Moving on, at number eight, we have the fake shipwreck. In August of 1981, a Hong Kong freighter known as the Primrose ended up getting in a shipwreck a couple of meters away from the North Sentinel Island. As soon as this happened, they were greeted by 50 locals with spears and arrows. They began launching attacks at the boat. The captain immediately made a desperate call for help, asking for weapons to be airdropped so they could defend themselves. Thankfully, the crew members were rescued by a helicopter and left uninjured. But the remains of the wrecked ship still remain near the island. Theory goes that this never even happened? A shipwreck never occurred and the ship was just placed there as a ploy to make the story more credible. Now, why would they make this up? Well, to make the story of this dangerous island more credible. Again, to prevent outsiders from trespassing on the island. Either to keep the Sentinelese safe or to keep their top secret facility safe. In our seventh spot, we have the tsunami. In 2004, a big tsunami struck the North Sentinel Island. When things settled, a bunch of Indian Coast Guard helicopters flew over the island to see if they needed any help. They expected the worst outcome. But surprisingly, everything was okay. They managed to survive this deadly tsunami. The question is, how? 
Well, that's when this theory comes in. Some believe that the Sentinelese were protected by amulets of ancestral bones. They sensed the storm was coming and went out and scattered pig and turtle skulls around their island. And in the end, that is what protected them from this deadly storm. Coming in at number six, we have the encounter. In 1991, a group of Indian anthropologists led by Mr. Pandit made peaceful contact with the Sentinelese. It started off with them bringing gifts for them, like coconuts, to show them they mean no harm. In fact, there's some photos and videos of this team's interaction with the tribe, and it's astonishing. The Sentinelese didn't seem afraid at all. So, what happened? What changed their ways? I mean, in 1996, the Indian government banned any researchers from visiting the island. But what caused them to become more hostile towards outsiders again? Theory goes that between 1991 and 1996, something very bad happened. Like an encounter gone wrong. The government is scared of bringing outsider diseases to the island. Maybe that's exactly what happened, which led to the ban in 1996. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with John Allen Chow. In November of 2018, John Allen Chow believed with the power of God, he would be able to convert the Sentinelese to Christianity and help them. He believed that this island was Satan's last stronghold on earth. He felt it was his mission to help them. So he went there from America and tried to make contact with them. John's first attempt at making contact with them didn't go as planned. As soon as he stepped foot on the island, several men came charging at him, firing arrows. So he fled. But on November 16th, he tried again. He got a fisherman to drop him off alone. And that was the last time anyone had seen him. They just assumed he had been taken captive by the locals and was killed. But his body was never recovered. In fact, they tried to recover his body a number of times, but have never been successful. Theory goes though that John is actually still alive and is living there with them in peace. According to anthropologist T.N. Pandit, who has encountered the group on a number of occasions, he has described them as being largely peace-loving. But when they see someone new invading their territory, they get violent. But if Pandit was able to gain their trust and get close to them, maybe John actually was able to do the same. Who knows? According to a fisherman, he saw the tribe members dragging a dead body by a rope, but we don't know if that really was John's. Moving on, at number four, we have the government experimentation. Theory goes that the government is actually holding the Sentinelese captive there. This is all against their will. Why are they doing this? Well, theory goes that they are running a number of experiments on them, like how long they are able to sustain their hunter-gatherer lifestyle, or how long they can go living and repopulating with a small amount of people. Because in the end, there's not going to be a lot of genetic variety there. There have already been concerns about inbreeding going on. Maybe this is all done at the hands of the Indian government. In our third spot, we have the Malaysian Flight 370. On March 8th of 2014, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 disappeared without a trace. To this day, no one knows what happened to this flight and the 227 passengers and 12 crew members on board. But NVJDS on Reddit has a theory on the flight's disappearance. He thinks that the missing flight was purposely crashed onto North Sentinel Island. Since the island keeps everyone away, no one would go looking there for a plane and they wouldn't be able to even if they tried. As for why the plane was crashed there, I have no idea. But this kind of makes sense. Researchers that have tried to make contact with the island said the Sentinelese had new weapons made of metal. How could they get their hands on metal? Well, if a plane crashed there, they would have access to a lot of metal scraps, which was then used to make better spears and arrows. And in our second spot, we have the brainwashing. Okay, this is another pretty extreme and messed up theory, but as you know from Lindsay's earlier point, John Allen Chow went to North Sentinel Island to try and help the Sentinelese, a move that many think was dumb and pointless. But John was determined to bring Christianity to them. Theory goes that John was actually brainwashed and sent there on a mission on behalf of other missionaries. In 2017, during a boot camp missionary training, that's when he first got the idea to preach to the Sentinelese. Theory goes, that something went down to that training, maybe the missionaries were all brainwashed with different missions, John's being to make connection to the tribe. And in our number one spot, we have Maurice Vidal Portman. This theory was shared on Twitter by the user Respectable Lawyer. They might have discovered why the Sentinelese people are so violent towards outsiders. Let's take a look at a man named Maurice Vidal Portman. Back in the day, Maurice was assigned to look over the Andaman Islands and the Andamanese, but he ended up kidnapping some locals and took disturbing photos of them. 
He also would treat them like objects and would measure every inch of them. Every inch. He had an unhealthy obsession with them. He did this up until 1880 when he started focusing on North Sentinel Island. He abducted an elderly couple there who soon passed away from outside diseases. So it's thought that he did the same thing to the Sentinelese people. And this is what caused them to become so defensive to outsiders. Because in the past, this creepy man abducted members of their tribe and ran tests on them. In the end, they are scared this will happen again. Coming in at number 10, we have the Chimbu Skeleton Tribe. One look at this tribe sends shivers down my spine. And if I saw them in the flesh, I would very much want to run away. It seems that the Chimbu tribe dressed this way for special festivals, including the Mount Hagen Festival. The paint was originally designed to psychologically intimidate enemies and also to present themselves as superhuman. The tribe live in a remote mountainous region of Papua New Guinea and first made contact with the connected world in 1934, although they do remain elusive and to be honest, painted like that, I wouldn't want to run into them. I wouldn't want to mess with them. Coming in at number 9, we have the Asaro tribe. Have a look at the Asaro tribe. Usually I wouldn't say you should ever judge people by the way they look, but when it comes to tribes I would say, actually, if they look threatening, that's because they want to scare you. They want to scare you off and like maybe you should be scared off. What happens if you don't heed that warning? Do you really want to find out? The Asaro tribe are also known as the Asaro Mudmen because of their masks which are made from mud. They're also hella spooky. The story behind the mud is that one time they approached an enemy after hiding out in a muddy bank. The enemy thought that they were spirits and fled. Would you like to see them in action? actually pretty harmless, but their masks do make me worry. Coming in at number 8 we have the Chukchi people. The reason this tribe are on this list is because they are the only tribe in Russia that were never conquered by the Russian people, which actually must mean that they're pretty terrifying and hardcore. Historically, Russia has waged war with the Chukchi people on many occasions over hundreds of years. While some of the tribe's people were killed, they were never actually defeated. These days they live reasonably undisturbed in the Chukchi Peninsula. This is at the very north of Russia, parallel to the top of Alaska. Is cold up there. These people survive in those climates 24 7, and to be honest, to me, that makes them pretty hardcore and not to be crossed. Ah, a ghost at number 7, we have the Night Marchers. I really enjoy this, something different for this list. Often called the Night Marchers, the Hawakapo are ancient Hawaiian warriors that now are jobbed with escorting newly dead spirits into the afterlife. These are a more musical band of Grim Reapers. The Hawakapo are also known as torchbearers, and they walk across the land carrying you guessed it, torches, but also weapons and drums which they play and chant. There have been sightings of these ghostly torchbearers, but if you ever come across one, you must not look them in the eye, as they may mistakenly class you as someone who needs to be marched into the afterlife. That is, unless one of your relatives is in the tribe who can vouch for you. It's rules. Those are the rules. You know that the Hoakapo are nearby if you hear distant drumming in Hawaii, if you hear conch shell horns, see faint torchlight and smell faint foul odours. Rumours and reports of torchbearer sightings have been rife over the years and are absolutely ingrained in Hawaiian folklore. Unless you want to be marched down into heaven or hell or wherever they're going, I would say stay away from the tribe. Coming in at number 6 we have the Korubo or the Dasala tribe. The Korubo, also known as the Dasala tribe, are well known for their big clubs, as in big sticks. The Korubo are one of the most isolated tribes in the world and they do not want to be contacted. The tribe are visually scary to look at, they paint themselves with red dye made from the Ruko plant. The tribe lives in the western Amazon basin and regularly have clashes with other local tribes. They use their clubs to beat people to death. They are also fond of the humble poison dart. The tribe are hostile to outsiders and in recent history they have beat to death three loggers and workers from Funai, a Brazilian government initiative to protect indigenous tribes. Coming into number 5 we have the Surma tribe. The Surma live in the bench magi zone of the southern nations, nationalities and peoples regions of Ethiopia. The tribe are particularly scary and dangerous, especially if you are an outsider like us, because instead of clubs, spears or darts, the bands have automatic guns. 
guns. Yikes. Guns aside, for the moment, the tribe do have a tradition of beating one another with sticks as a rite of passage before they can officially become a man. So, as you can gather, the Surma don't shy away from violence. While the Surma do have guns and are hostile to outsiders, there aren't actually any reported instance of them shooting anyone. So, I guess while things may seem barbaric to us, who are we to judge them? They probably just want to do their own tribe business and let us leave them alone. Coming in at number four, we have the Angori sect. The Angori sect are infinite infamous for their morbid worship practices. Now, they use a corpse during their rituals and they often threaten to eat people. Have a watch of a CNN reporter interacting with them. Honestly, this freaked me out. Can you imagine being in this situation? People on that side of the river are so afraid of the Agori. <laughs> That's right, he actually said that I'd be terrified. The reporter then starts asking questions which are not met with a happy response. Have a listen. Why do you I wow! I absolutely think I'd be bricking it. The sect are very secretive and they generally shy away from interactions with others and honestly, that's enough to make me want to stay away from them. Okay, next up, not 100% a tribe, but like a terrifying story and a terrifying jungle gang in Papua New Guinea. At number three, we have the Cargo Cult. This is such a scary story. This story starts with Stephen Tarry, a man who gathered thousands of disciples in Papua New Guinea. He lured them into the jungle and encouraged them to be part of his sect. The man wore white robes and preached his own gospel while standing on a rock and calling himself, and I quote, Black Jesus. The cult lived in the jungle much like a tribe, and Tari was their leader. He would regularly lead ritual human sacrifice, which is repugnant. On one occasion, he slaughtered a virgin he called his flower girl and encouraged his following to drink her blood. One mother testified that she was made to drink her own daughter's blood. Now it seems that the tribe-like cult turned against him, and actually the leader was murdered himself in 2013. I guess he got what was coming to him. Okay, at number two, I've put a tribe you've probably heard heard of, I'm saving one at number one that you might not have heard of, getting a lot of press, we have the Sentinelese tribe. So you may have heard of this tribe in regards to the recent murder of John Allen Chow. He was a 26 year old American missionary who was sent by the All Nations group to make contact and live with amongst the tribe. Basically, they were hoping to convert them to Christianity, which really wasn't a good idea because they killed him. This is the theme with people who come too close to this tribe. Now the North Centennial Island is amid the Indian Ocean and has been home to the tribe for around 60,000 years. Until recently, the tribe has only been spotted through far off images. But people keep getting closer and closer to them these days and they don't like it. They've been known to fire arrows at low flying planes. It's hard to contact a tribe who have literally no interest in communication, but most of those who have tried just haven't lived to tell the tale. Some have met their fury by accident, for example in 2006 two fishermen who were illegally harvesting crabs were killed by the tribe. Now Chow, the missionary, is the most recent victim. He kept a journal of his attempts to contact the tribe and he sang songs and offered them the bible, but actually instead they shot and pierced the holy book with an arrow. I think this should have been a warning to him, but he persisted to no avail and was met with a mixture of laughter and hostility. In the end, it all got too much for the tribe who decided decided to kill him. He was last seen by the crew who went with him on the adventure. He was dragged away. They said they saw him dragged away and killed, and they saw his lifeless body spotted on the shore. Gnarly. Finally coming into number one, we have the Korowai tribe. The Korowai tribe are one of the most feared tribes in the world. They were only discovered in 1974, and since then, encounters have been very limited. The tribe are based in Papua New Guinea, and they are known to live in trees, as to have a height advantage when intruders come into their space. They are known to shoot arrows at any trespassers, and they believe that white people are actually possessed by ghosts or demons. So obviously as a white person wandering into this tribe, you can imagine what might happen to you. It is actually thought that the Korowai tribe killed Michael Rockefeller, who disappeared after attempting contact in the 1960s. Some reports say that his body was seen amid the tribe on a beach. Now, in 2014, Australian journalist Paul Raphael visited the tribe and discovered that they do still very much eat 
eat people. That's right, they cannibalize the body of people who die under mysterious circumstances. Why? Because they think that they've been possessed by a kakua. A kakua basically is a bad, bad spirit. The logic is they must eat the kakua as the kakua ate the person who died. It's an act of revenge. Everything is eaten by the tribe except the hair, nails, and penis. Do you want to stumble across this tribe? Rather you than me. 